No at all, Ben. Um, so again, uh, if you've got anything that you particularly like me to go through, um, the chat is open for your suggestions. Um, Otherwise, I will go through some of the exercises which were related to last week's homework and just make some comments there. Okay, so let's look, for example, then at uh, 2.43. Sorry, no, I don't mean that. I mean trying to adjust the <clears throat> camera here. So what does 244 say? Uh, Find a sentence, so formula with no free variables, sigma, so that sigma is absolute Sorry, I'm having trouble with this today. So sigma is absolute for V alpha. If alpha is a limit ordinal. Well, let's say implies. Actually, the, the exercise says then. It says if sigma is absolute, then alpha is a limit ordinal. <laughs> And the sigma we'll choose will, in fact, show that um, that's an if and only if. So, okay, so here's a V alpha. It's a layered cake like this. <clears throat> if alpha is a limit ordinal, V alpha is the union of the previous stages. So if alpha is a limit, then V alpha is the union of the previous stages. Moreover, the ordinals intersect V alpha are precisely alpha, for any alpha. It doesn't have to be a limit. Okay, so if alpha is a limit ordinal, it's a union of the previous slices down here. So I just need an assertion that enforces the fact that the ordinals in V alpha have no largest element, which is, would be the case if they were a successor, if alpha was a successor. So solution, well, the idea is We just need a sigma that enforces if true in V alpha 
that there is no largest ordinal. See, so for, for some successor here, some V beta plus one, there is a largest ordinal, namely beta. The ordinals in V beta plus one are precisely the ordinals in beta plus one. So the largest ordinal here is beta. So if it's a limit, there is no largest ordinal. So I just write a sentence down, which does that for me. So that's, that, that's all you have to say right here. So all Sigma has to do is to just say something like, for gamma, there is a beta. So beta is in an, an ordinal which is kind of implicit in the notation. We use Greek to denote ordinals. And beta is bigger than gamma. So this ensures there is no largest ordinal. I think you don't have to say much more about it as an answer here. But I mean, let's just talk about it a little bit more. Right? then what you have is that sigma is going to hold in V alpha, right? If and only if, well, for all gamma less than alpha, there is a beta less than alpha, such that beta is an ordinal and beta is bigger than gamma. And that's just another way of saying, right, half is a limit ordinal here. And this here is actually a delta zero expression. These are bounded quantifiers. Remember, less than is the same as membership. Okay, and being an ordinal, this is all, what is this? This is, <clears throat> Page, page 41, line 1242. One, two, four, two, et cetera. <clears throat> well, this is, again is just an epsilon formula. It's just saying gamma is an epsilon, is a member of beta. Right? But being an ordinal, is delta zero as well. So this is a transitive set. These are absolute for delta zero formulae. So indeed I can say here, if and only if. Well, I can't say sigma holds in V because this is about all ordinals. So let me stop here at this point. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping this will become, uh, <clears throat> well, maybe not second nature to you, but at least not, not puzzling or not difficult. The exercise continues. Repeat the exercise and find tor, so that if tor is absolute for V beta, then beta is the beta -th cardinal. So it then continues. Repeat the exercise and find a tor so that if tor is absolute for V beta, 
then beta is the beta cardinal. I think it's beta aleph, yeah. I think the exercise will be better phrased by just saying what we what we want is a sentence again a sentence tall so that if it's just true in v beta then beta is the beta the cardinal i think that would be a better way to rephrase the phrase the question now i mean there's a point here is that being a cardinal of course is not something in general that's absolute from transitive models even transitive ZF minus models. But the Vs are a very special case, right? The Vs are everything. So, so let me kind of aside here. Just have some discussion about that. Suppose f takes some gamma here onto beta. So this is an onto function, and gamma is less than beta. So f is showing that beta is not a cardinal. Right? There's an onto map from something smaller, smaller. Beta is not a cardinal. And F shows that the cardinality of beta is less than or equal to gamma, which is less than beta. And now this here is a set of ordered pairs, right? So actually, if you check, Right. What is F? It's a subset of V beta cross V beta. But as, as a Cartesian product, all of these ordered pairs, these are all in V beta as well. So this F, which shows us that beta is not a cardinal, actually is an element of V beta plus one. So the rank of F is beta. And if you like, F is in V beta plus one. So if I want to know whether beta is a cardinal or not, indeed, I have to look through the universe and see whether there are onto functions like this. But actually where to look is in V beta plus one. So immediately just above beta, I can find functions that will be onto beta or co finally into beta. Indeed, every function whose domain is less than beta and maps into beta is in here in V beta plus one. So that's where these questions can be answered. And this is a model of very little set theory, right? But it's a special case because it happens to have all of the sets of rank uh, less than or equal to beta in it. So V beta plus one. So so beta is a cardinal. Or beta is not a cardinal or is or is not. whichever the case may be. If and only if this holds in V beta plus one.
So though being a cardinal is not in general absolute for ZF minus models, to repeat myself, it is absolute for V beta plus one, if we're talking about beta. So though being a cardinal is not absolutely definite. Now recall from what we were saying, that means absolute for transitive ZF minus models. It is absolute here for beta in V beta plus one. And likewise, being the power set, right? If gamma is less than beta, and the power set of gamma, this is also in V beta plus one. So again, V beta plus one is absolute for the power set operation. For gamma less than beta. <clears throat> I don't say gamma equals beta because the power set of beta, right? is not an element of V beta plus one. It's an element of V beta plus two. Okay, so that's the aside. So we go back to the question. Find a sentence tor, says the tor holds in V beta or is absolute for V beta, then beta is the beta th cardinal. So we're asking for something um, for something more there. If it gives you a hint, in fact, the hint is the answer. So just consider the statement here. For every beta, Aleph sub beta exists. And I think all you have to do for to answer this is to think about how you're going to write this down as a sentence in in, in said theory. So here would be alpha and V alpha. And what I need to know is that when I enumerate the Alephs, for every ordinal beta, I've got a beta of Aleph, which is what this is saying. So for any beta that's down here, that better be some omega beta as well, somewhere or other, below alpha. So one way of doing this is to say, okay, I'll look at the function that enumerates the Alephs and I'll just make sure this function is total. So I could say something like this, and there's, there's no, no various things you could say. So let tor be the following sentence, right? So it just says, for every gamma, there is a function and the domain of F is gamma and F is in monotone increasing And 
Its range is contained in the cardinals. So all that just says is there's a gamma sequence of cardinals. So you pick a gamma right here, and it just says F picks out, sorry, a gamma sequence of cardinals in some increasing fashion. So an ascending gamma sequence. So, I mean, that's what I mean. It's a function of domain gamma, which is increasing. So if that's the case, right, there has to be at least cardinals omega zero up to omega gamma. For every gamma, then here, a cardinal of the form. Omega or Aleph sub gamma there. I guess I could have said here that the function F has to be an initial segment of the cardinals. Um, then it might have been clear that the range of F was all the cardinals below. Yeah, maybe that's that's perhaps a nicer way to put it. Let's look at Tor prime. like this. For all gamma, there is a G. So the G is a function. And the domain of G equals gamma. Again, G is monotone increasing. And let's say the range of G is an initial segment of the cardinals. So by putting it like that, I'm kind of committing myself to saying here's alpha, I mean, here's gamma, right? And my function G, here's zero, it's going to, it's going to be omega zero. Here's one, this is going to be omega one, and so on. So these are going to be the cardinals, initial segment of the cardinals below omega gamma. So if I've got tor prime holding inside V alpha, we have that um, an alpha is a limit. Right, just to keep things keep things simple. Then if gamma is less than alpha. All the card, the range of G will then be the cardinals below omega sub gamma. So by this having this sentence true in V alpha, I'm assured for every gamma. I've got a sequence of all the cardinals up to omega gamma. So in particular for gamma plus one, there's an omega gamma. Right? 
hence for, hence for any delta less than alpha, omega delta is going to be in V alpha. But that's what we want. We want something that guarantees for every beta, omega beta is there inside V alpha. So what we do, we just take this tor prime. So if I take tor prime plus the sigma, which we had from the first part, if this is true in V alpha, then for all delta less than alpha, omega delta is in V alpha. So, and we're done. Okay, are there any questions there about that? Okay. Right. Sorry, I'm just looking uh, to seeing what I was going to do next. Okay. No. Can I go over 243? Okay. Sure. Which one is that? Okay. Show for every formula phi of the language. I think I, yeah, we have discussed this before. So it proves there is a CUB class C of ordinals such that I pick any alpha in C for any gadgets that I could plug into the free variables of the formula, phi x holds if and only if it holds in V alpha. So this is part of the reflection theorem. This would be a statement of the reflection theorem except it asks for the CUB class. The reflection theorem just says there are unboundedly many alpha that are like this. For every beta, there is an alpha for which this holds. So the exercise is basically asking you to go back and think about that proof, because the proof actually shows this. It doesn't just show that there are unboundedly many such alpha, it shows there's a CUB class of such alpha. So, and the hint given there with the question says, well, indeed the reasoning of the lemma pretty much gives you that, that class. Reasoning of lemma, whatever it is, is that 240, 240. Um, pretty much shows this. As the closure points of the functions fi for i less than equal to n 
where um, I've got some list here, which is some formula closed. It contains the formula phi I'm interested in, which I've just written down at the beginning. of phi together with all its subformula. Right. So so not quite sure how much to say here. I don't want to repeat the whole proof from the from the from the notes <clears throat> but if you recall what we did there we define these functions gi right what gi did was say if so if phi i on this list here right about some objects, if this was equivalent to there is some x phi j where phi j was something else on the list but was shorter, right? Then we took gi of y vec to be to be the least place where we could find such an x. If eta is least, so that if phi i y vector holds, then there is an x in v eta such that phi j eta y vector holds. After all, if it holds, there's an X somewhere or other in the universe. So we look and see where we can find one. So the modification of this over that lemma is we're just particularizing to the V's, the V eaters rather than the Z eaters. The lemma was more about more general hierarchies. And this was zero if there was no such thing. And then we took Fi Xi here To be the supremum of all of these gi y vectors for y vector in v xi. So given a level, we look at all the tuples which are there in that level and we look through the universe to see where we can find these x's. This is a set this is a function defined on a set by the axiom replacement. This supremum exists. So GI is a well defined function. And by the axiom of replacement, Fi xi exists for every xi. So to define the class that we're being asked for here, we look at the closure points of all of these Fi's. Let C be those alphas, right? So that for all i less than or equal to n, if I apply f alpha, f i to alpha, this is all contained in alpha. So alpha is a closure point of the function f i. I pick something less than alpha fi of it is less than alpha. 
So now I've got places where So now, if I pick some y vector in V alpha, then if phi vector, phi y vector holds, then there is an x, this is phi i, then, oh no, this, this is phi itself. Then, phi of y vector holds in V alpha. By that argument from the reflection theorem. That's sorry, that's the by the task you walked. Criterion lemma, which was the one before. That says if you can close up under finding existential witnesses, then you're going to be absolute. So we're going to have this absoluteness here. So the C here is the class of these closure points, and C is unbounded in the ordinals. I can always start with some large psi and find a larger closed point, and it's also closed. If you're a limit of closure points, you're a closure point. C is unbounded in ON. By that reflection theorem. So by the argument above, right? And it's closed. Since if alpha is a limit of alpha bars, which are closed under the FIs, so is alpha closed under the FIs. Closed under the FIs. So is alpha closed under the FIs. I mean, that's what I mean by being closed under the FIs. So that establishes the existence of these classes C. Okay, that's literally enough. I think, well, sorry, that answers literally the exercise. There's something more in the remark there about um, taking an intersection over infinite collections of phi's and how we'd get a contradiction from that. I don't know if you're asking about that or not, but this would be, I think, more than enough detail to answer the exercise here. Okay, hope that's um, enough of that. Okay, two, four, seven.
So this is about strong inaccessibility. It's kappa bigger than omega and V kappa equals H kappa. Implied that kappa is strongly inaccessible. Okay, so just a reminder, middle letters of the Greek alphabet tend to be cardinals. So something like kappa here, you can see in, in the question I haven't said kappa a cardinal, right? But the assumption is that middle letters of the Greek alphabet so kappa lambda mu right? these are cardinals we use Greek letters in general to denote ordinals because cardinals are a special kind of ordinal. So kappa lambda mu, if you see a kappa floating around, it's unless it's been specified, it's pretty certainly going to mean a cardinal. And lambda so, but perhaps with less force. Okay, so I'm assuming here that kappa is a cardinal in this notation. So you might think, oh, didn't we have a lemma about this somewhere? And if you then look back at lemma something or other, 248, you can see why this does not apply. Because in 248, the assumption is that kappa is regular and that's missing. So 248 does not apply here. So is that assumed that kappa was regular? And there's no mention of that in the assumptions on here. So this is a clue, right? Perhaps if kappa is singular, then this won't imply that kappa is strongly inaccessible. Who knows? Right? Maybe I can find a kappa where this holds and kappa is singular. And that would falsify the implication because being strongly inaccessible definitely includes kappa as regular. Find a kappa which is singular and with h kappa equals v kappa. This would then show that this would give the answer now. because a singular is not strongly inaccessible. And with that in mind, we can just look for an example of V kappa that contains all of H kappa here. So let kappa be 
be the least fixed point of the Beth function. Right, so this is the function that goes from alpha and returns Beth sub alpha. And recall how we define that, Beth zero is omega, Beth alpha plus one is two to the Beth alpha, and at limits we take unions. So this is the supremum of all the smaller ones. So it goes up according to the size of power sets, cardinal exponentiation. So how do I find this least fixed point of the Beth function? This is the least kappa. So if the kappa is Beth kappa, that's what it would be to be a fixed point of this function. You plug in kappa and you get back Beth kappa, but that has to be the same as what you've plugged in. It's a fixed point. And these exist just in the same way as there are cardinals kappa, which equal Aleph sub kappa. How do you find this? So let gamma zero just be Aleph zero, which is Beth zero. And then let gamma n be not Beth one, not Beth n, let's say gamma n plus one. Beth gamma n here. So it's not the nth Beth number in this hierarchy, it's the gamma nth Beth number. So this goes very fast through the Beth numbers. So let kappa be the supremum of these gamma n's. And cofinality of kappa is omega, it's the supremum of these gamma n's here. So it's got cofinality omega. And now we just need to check that V kappa is H kappa. So H kappa contained in V kappa is lemma 231, which applies for all cardinals. Two thirty one two here, and then in the other direction, okay, the size of the alpha, right. It's two to the beth alpha. At least again for omega squared less than alpha. Yeah. Well, in particular for large alphas less than kappa. V alpha is a transitive set. And its size is less than using this here. This is less than kappa. Right? Because this here is just Beth alpha plus one, right? But kappa is a fixed point in the Beth function. 
So alpha is less than kappa, alpha plus one is less than kappa, so beta alpha plus one is less than kappa here. So what have I got? V alpha is a transitive set of size less than kappa. So V alpha is a member of H kappa. And alpha was arbitrary less than kappa. So every V alpha for alpha less than kappa is an element. Hence V kappa, which is the union of all of these V alphas here, this is contained in H kappa. So that gives the other direction of this. It finishes the conversely here. And we have equality. That finishes that exercise there. So this does not imply this because we've just constructed a counterexample. We've constructed an example of a cardinal where V kappa equals H kappa, but it's singular. 